What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. You know we love to bring special guests on that can give y'all the knowledge that, you know, makes it easy to skip college for y'all who want to do that these days. <laughs> this is Damian Ritter, man. This dude is... Um, a manager of comedian Big Ja, who's popping, he's successful. He's director of communications at uh, one of the biggest upcoming distributors called Two Loss. Y'all have heard us talk about Two Loss, so we're going to get into a little bit of that there. He was the CEO of Funk Volume, if mm-hmm. I that was the correct role, I said that right, right? Yeah. And, um, Funk Volume was, I mean, and we're talking about the, the, the 2000, early 2010s, that was... Like one of the behemoths, multi million dollar indie like behemoth, which like doing multiple hundreds of thousands, right, is a beautiful thing when we talk about indie. That's a hard thing to do, especially back then. So we're gonna get into some of that. But obviously, the point is this man is somebody who's worth talking to. This 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 ain't a run of the run of the mill guess, because we don't do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so to start off, man, first of all, appreciate having you on, Dane. No, I appreciate you guys having me for a second time. Always cool chopping it up with y'all. I That's appreciate right. it. That's right, man. Yep. You one of the few second <laughs> second timers, man. <laughs> no, JR's been on twice. He's been on twice, but he's he been on the channel three times because I did a talk with you years ago when it was like some Zoom type stuff. Okay. So, you know, it can put you ahead if you want to go that way. For sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I want to get right into it, man, just to value because you have so much to provide. And I think a good place to start, right? You had funk volume in terms of how you entered the industry. Um, several artists. Um, how many artists did y'all have? Uh, we have like, four artists and a producer or two. Yeah, maybe? we signed four producers. Four producers. Yeah, right. Did multiple millions in that era, but now you've continued to manage over the years. Probably the last artist you managed was probably what, like twenty twenty two, maybe uh, music artist. Yeah, yeah. I would. I I worked with Futuristic for for a minute. All right. That right. was before twenty twenty two. That was probably before. It was before the pandemic. Okay. Man, yeah. time flies. Yeah. Right. The point is, right. You've stayed in the game and seen so many different times yep. um, parts of the game and have worked through multiple eras. So I would love to know if you were building a funk volume today, yeah, right in this era, y'all were very innovative back then. Yeah, how would you look to do that? I guess a good way to even start to be so we can be specific. We can start with the artist side, then the label, like yeah. or general side. So how would you look to like work? With an artist, breaking artist. I feel like today, like if Funk Volume continued to exist, we would have continued. We would have crushed it mm-hmm. because I think today you consistently have to be present, right? And when you when you're working with a label, there's less pressure on one individual artist to keep up with things, right? Mm-hmm. So what I mean by that is like, you know, if I was running the label still, you know, Hot would be putting out an album. But the other guys will be supporting that and be on the album, right? And then when that album cycle will be over, like Dizzy would probably be putting out an album. And then when that album cycle, mm-hmm. like, we'd always have something to push and promote, like some Master P type stuff. And even basically. exactly, yeah. even if, so, even when it wasn't the music, we're probably touring. And if we weren't touring, then we're putting out a documentary. And if we're not putting out a documentary, then we're doing our community service initiative. Okay. And if we're not doing that, we're hosting a contest or a virtual conference. There were always so many things to push and promote and giving people different entry points to learn about the artist and the label. So I think we would it it would have been not easy for it would this would have been the time to really shine mm-hmm. because you know I think the content would have just gotten better. Everything would have just gotten better. We would have made more relationships and just been on bigger platforms. Um, so that's kind of what artists need to do themselves, right? Is just kind of build their world and be consistent with their messaging, being consistent with the content and just give fans different opportunities to learn about who they are, um, so that they become fans of them. I mean, you guys talk about this stuff all the time. So I wish, I, you know, I, I wish we could have kept going to be in this time. Cause I feel like we would have crushed it. I feel like we would have definitely crushed this era for sure. Yeah, I mean, 
everything you said, it actually reminds me of a, the conversation we just had the other day uh, or yesterday that whenever when they were talking about always on, mm-hmm. right? You basically are talking about from a label perspective, yeah. Right? There's always something happening, right? Mm-hmm. Where there's never a day where fans can't come yeah. in, they can't consume. There's always something being put out so they can stay in the world. Mm-hmm. And you know, if I can keep them in my world, then I can hold that attention to guide them towards something else. Right? Yeah. You, you you're pretty much a, a full blown TV network at that point. Yeah. Right. We were actually thinking of getting into comedy too, because I work I work with Big Job now, who's a comedian, um, and he has a, a pretty sizable platform now. But mm-hmm. I wanted to get him involved because we were going to start Funk Volume TV, you know, mm-hmm. to eventually pitch to a network. But until then, just kind of do it on YouTube. We had a lot of plans, you know, um, just to be able to use the brand to just do some other interesting things. Um, so yeah, maybe Job would have been a part of Funk Volume TV as opposed to having like his own platform um you know but things work out the way they're supposed to work out and jaw's doing amazing so i mean it is what it is but but yeah it would have been you know th- this time i feel like would have been perfect for us but you know ultimately like i said that's what that's what artists should be working on their own kind of smaller version of that to build the momentum to you know have the options to do bigger things as well it was funk, funk volume aside right so Taking that same experience, but not with those same characters, like and just looking at the game today, right? Mm-hmm. I, I know you're not trying to necessarily just hop in with an oh, artist yeah, or yeah. just hop in <laughs> with, uh, and, and build a label overnight. But let's just say, as a manager, if you had to pick an artist right now, what would be like an ideal ideal situation if you were like looking for an artist? What would you be looking for? To say, okay, that's the type of artist that I want to manage and build around. Um, so I think at this point, I feel like the artist has to have some momentum already. Okay. Um, they have to, you know, have to th- think the music is amazing. I think they have to be comfortable on camera. They have the solid understanding of what their brand, their messaging is. Uh, willing to put in the work. Willing to be consistent. Put out music. Put out content. Uh, they have to have some interest in learning the business. Right, because working with artists that don't really understand the business, I'm not doing that again. Because uh, it's it's frustrating when you need to have certain conversations. Uh, communication has to be on point. Um, that's one another thing that was lacking in my funk volume experience. Um, so, because when you're working with an artist, especially when you have something going on, like we're in constant communication, because there's something going on all the time. So even with Big Job right now, like we're we're constantly working on something. So right now we're shooting. His most popular series is the Lesbian Homie, so we're working on season <laughs> season three of the Lesbian Homie, um, <laughs> and there's so much that we want to do around that, right? So, uh, we're, so we're thinking about doing a premiere not only in LA but in New York. You know, we, we're thinking about putting together a soundtrack for it. Um, so the communication has to be on point because I think dope managers are always thinking about like what we can do to advance things. Mm. Right, and I, I think that's just extremely. Va- I think artists typically undervalue like a manager or don't really know what a manager does. But just think about having somebody that's constantly thinking about how to grow your business. Mm. Like that's extremely va- and can execute. Right, like that's extremely valuable. Um, so when you're arguing, if you have somebody like that and you keep arguing, like I don't want to give you twenty percent. Like you know, if they're locked in, that's that's <laughs> worth a lot more than twenty percent, in my opinion. But, but, but yeah. But let me let me ask you this, Dan, because you you said a couple things in your answer that I feel like I'm gonna get the, the, the pitchforks raised in the comments. But you okay. said two things you would look for is an artist that already has some momentum. Yeah, and then an artist that is willing to learn the business. Um, yeah, we understand why you would say that, but just from a manager label exec standpoint can you explain why the, the pre-momentum is so important yeah because if you were a manager worth your salt man Take me from yeah you can, nah. you can get me popping what you mean <laughs> nah it's especially a, maybe a younger manager can take that that risk and has that time you know but if it's and i wasn't just in a management situation right yeah. like i owned half the label so i was protected more than a typical manager mm. right but a lot of a lot of times managers get fired kind of out of nowhere, right? 
And if you're working with somebody that doesn't have any momentum, that's not making any money, you're essentially doing an internship, an unpaid internship. That's what you're asking that person to do. Um, so you're telling me I have to put all this sweat equity in and then you can get mad at me in a year and then I'm just asked out? Like, nah, I don't, I'm, so younger managers might need to take chances on artists like that to build up a resume to get some experience. But like an older manager, like I'm not, I'm not going through that again. You know what I'm saying? I'm not putting in all that sweat equity. You know, you're not, we're not making anything right now. And then potentially something goes wrong or somebody gets in your ear and, you know, yeah. wants to be your manager. And then you're like deuces because you claim I didn't really do anything, but because you didn't understand the business, you didn't understand what I was doing or what kind of role I actually played in your business. So that's why it's important to understand the business because if you don't understand the business, you can't really properly value your team, not mm -hmm. just your manager, anybody on your team. So, you know, you need to learn the business, not just to understand what moves you need to make, but you also need to learn the business so that you understand that I'm not just plug and play. There's differences between managers. If you do know the business, you understand a good manager versus a bad manager or a good business manager versus a bad man business manager, mm -hmm. right? Or So that's why you need to, you don't need to understand the business like I understand the business, but you need to have a certain level of understanding so we can be on the same page when we have certain conversations. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, stop what you're doing. We got to interrupt you to let you know you can win $20,000 by submitting your music to twolost.com slash collab for the crown. We're looking for the best songs and we're partnering with Two Lost. So if you think you got some great music, if you think you got the goods, go to that site, twolost.com slash collab for the crown. Check out the instructions for the contest. Win up to $20,000 and make sure you put in no label when you create your profile on Two Lost so you can make sure you get three months completely free. That's twolost.com slash collab for the crown. And again, when you sign up, put in the code, no label, all one word, and you will get three months completely free. Go win that $20,000. Cause you know, you got the goods, you got the talent. You just got to make sure you submit peace. I got a question for both of y'all while we're on artists and how, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you've managed many, many have asked Tricori to manage them. You know, I know you, oh, and you've managed, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. so there, there's this popular, <laughs> there, you know, there's a, there's a popular question right now. It's, it's been a popular question, but, um, it, it bubbled up again cause it was on Ray Daniels podcast. So I would like to know y'all's opinion on talent versus clout, which one would you ha rather have? So we could start with, with you, and then Ja'Cory, I wanna hear your thoughts on it, man. Um, so wait, so talent versus clout? Would talent. I rather have somebody that's like running around doing pranks and just getting fat oh, followers? Or do, I, or do I want somebody that actually has talent, but they still have the work ethic, right? They still putting out content? Or no, uh, you can you can answer it how you however you think first. I mean, I, I <laughs> how do, how me personally, you? I I don't really want to be tied to like stuff that's a flash in the pan. Like I want to build something that hopefully stands the test of time. And to do that, you need talent, mm -hmm. right? So hopefully the talent comes with a certain level of work ethic. So even if this talent doesn't currently have like the two million followers that this prankster has, you know. But again, they got for me to jump in. I it's got to. It's got to be moving a little bit, yeah. you know, something. Um, so you need a little bit of clout. Can't yeah. just be talent. So nah, give me nah. a percentage then. Because to me, if you don't, because my brother was trying to convince me that there's like this amazing artist out there right now that is doing a lot of things right that only has 100 followers. And I just don't believe that that's, that's true. Like if, because if you were doing even a fraction of what you need to do, if the music is that amazing, even if you weren't, doing the additional content even if you were just consistently putting out music i feel like it would have a little bit of a a little bit of a community like my guy ali joseph right now yeah this is my guy he's super super talented he hasn't really have much going on on instagram and when i say that he probably has maybe like fourteen thousand followers or whatever but he's got he hit him he hit a million monthly listeners on spotify um, so he's doing it more with just consistency and just the quality of the music. So I feel like if they're, I just, I just can't, 
imagine finding somebody with a hundred followers that's like extremely amazing unless they're just like in a hole somewhere doing their thing. Like if they're trying even a little bit with amazing music, like you know, they they got five thousand, you know, ten. So you saying it's hard to have talent today without at least having some clout. Yeah, yeah. If you really, I mean, if you really stand out with the music, you know, because I think there's so much other music out there that is not quality. Like if you're putting out amazing music, then I feel like people will, you know, there's curators and stuff. People will people will find you. Got you. Got yeah. you. All right, Corey. Well, real quick, because because I, I feel like you brought up something really interesting, right? It's gonna piss people off. You said that in today's age, it's hard to be talented and not get some clout, right? Because to your point, eventually it will shine through. And we've seen as marketers, like we've seen content get put out that wasn't great, but the song behind it was so strong that it, mm-hmm. like it, it just kind of carried through and broke through. So I 100% agree with that. And with that being said, I'm taking clout. I'm gonna tell you why I'm gonna take clout. One, one of the greatest music artists of our generation ever started clout first. You know who that is? <laughs> Eddie Murphy, um, <laughs> but I would I would take Clout first just because I believe that um, I believe that you can take someone from bad to okay. okay, and I feel like in majority of music, like okay, will get you far enough. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's really hard sometimes to get an artist that's talented to do the things to become cloudy because they get so ego. Yeah. driven by the talent they feel like they're too good to do certain things that get some mm-hmm. of the audience usually from my experience like when i've met like influencers or people that already have an audience they're very much so down to do whatever to yeah. do that keeps the business going versus like artists that are talent first are usually the complete opposite like i'm not stepping outside of any bag that could possibly be a detriment to my talent and like i said i don't i don't think depending on the genre it's not the most difficult thing to do to build like a semi-talented person, like get you some vocal. I can make you. I feel like I can make you like a <laughs> like a hopper pop singer. You know what I'm saying? Like six months. You know what I'm saying? If I try hard enough. Um, and especially with music being a lot more, uh, I feel like open is a lot more people to collab with. A lot of the behind the scenes people that were typically the star makers of yesteryear are a lot more front facing now. Yeah, I think I would. I would take. I would take clout. I mean that's interesting. It may I, I think you make some some good points. I, but again, I, I I'm looking for the outlier. You know what I'm saying? Like as a manager, you should be looking for the outlier. You know that that special that special person. If you're gonna invest your time or resources into to somebody, um, you know, so it might what you're saying might work faster for sure. But for me, it just wouldn't be as fulfilling, and I wouldn't be as excited to like tell my friends about it. You know, so you, like, but but you're still hoping for somebody who's willing to do the work with clout, right? Yeah. Well, I, nah, to, I, to I, get to the to the clout, because I think that's the that's the difference, right? There's like, all right, you just have clout because you're out here doing some so whatever, or you just happen to have clout for whatever reason you already had it, yeah. and then there's a, all right, you're talented, and the question becomes, are you willing to do right. the things to help market and promote yourself so your talent does? get attached to some right. some level of clout, right? Well, I'm not hope I never look for anybody to like I don't like management. Like I don't want to be yeah. I never wanted to be a manager. Like mm. I came out from outside the music industry and we started a label together and I feel like, you know, the manager's role has evolved into so many things these days. And I felt like I was already doing the things as we were trying to grow this label that a manager would be doing. So mm. why would somebody else come in here you know, one, we didn't really have access to anybody. We were just kind of doing it dolo. But, um, you know, I kind of got thrust into a management role. Like, I don't love management. I love people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I yeah. I feel like I have a skill set that can be a catalyst in somebody to for somebody's success. So I do it gl- gladly and willingly. So I'm not, I don't hate my job, but I don't love management. You know, I, I just want to see cats win. Yes, let me ask you this. So in, in that context, like what what exactly is the, is the difference, right? Because it, it makes me think of, um, I'm sure y'all have seen like the Taraji P. Henson situation that's been going on, right? So there mm-hmm. was a clip where I remember Oprah was saying like, hey, it sounds like Taraji is mad at us about things that 
are really the studio's fault. And it makes me think of situations where an artist might be upset at the manager, right? Or thinking they're not doing certain things and it's really the label's job to do it and then vice versa. So in that context, you're right, like you wore both hats at the same time. Like what is the divide? Like what is the, right. what is technically the difference in the roles? So I never, speak, again, coming from outside and kind of learning the business when we were, when I was already starting a label and being a manager, I didn't, I I never looked at it different from what we were doing. Like I understand the difference now, yeah. but I feel like managers are tasked with, with, with so much, like sometimes the only difference is the label is funding you. Mm, okay. You know what I mean? And you guys are tasked with figuring everything else out. Yeah. Like sometimes the labels take, you know, keep make you a priority and you know will be more involved but sometimes labels are signing artists and they're pretty much like hey figure it out until you got something and then we'll you know we'll jump in and see what we can do yeah um so you know like i said i think the manager's role everything about the manager's role has evolved except for the percentage right <laughs> um so. see that's a big thing right there because the percentage in many ways, I know a lot of managers feel like that should change, right? Yeah. Just because we're doing so many different things, you're basically, if you want a CEO, essentially, yeah. versus back in the day, it's more so getting you, you some tours, yeah. right? Getting you, book, booking you for shows, that was... Connecting, the, like just connecting the dots, yeah. having certain conversations, right. you know? Yeah, I don't want to completely minimize, yeah. that's all they were doing, but yeah. now there's just so many opportunities. Yeah. There's no cookie cutter version of it because yeah. the infrastructure is really... I don't want to say it's it's diminished, but you have that traditional infrastructure, but then you have a infinite amount of other options. Do you want to really lean into gaming for your brand, sync for your brand? Do you really not care about touring or festivals at all? Do you want to build this personality? Do you want to be halfway an actor? There's so many ways that you can flip it, and it requires a special skill set and constant learning mm -hmm. to be able to delve into that, yeah. which makes me think back to that talent versus clout conversation. I think if you hear the answers that both of y'all said, something that artists should really take from it is the reason a lot of business people end up leaning towards, let's say, some version of clout or at least an artist who will work and be willing to put themselves out there versus just, hey, I got this talent and now I got to lift all the weight is because you have somebody who is completely reliant on you for their lifestyle. Right. Right. So it's like, if you think about it, artists, like that's what I try to get artists to do, like think on the other side of the table. If you're working with somebody and all your money is dependent on them, you have to live your life based on what they're willing to make. How would you feel if someone, yeah, they have all the talent in the world, but they're not willing to promote themselves and do certain things versus the other person who, yes, may be half as talented, but they still are talented. And possibly could develop, especially if you get the right situations or find their particular bag. Yeah. But they're willing to do all of the other things um, that are required. Like my analogy from our last conversation that uh, me and Ja'Cory had similar to this was like you can be a good basketball player, but you might not be a good NBA player. Mm -hmm. Right. Because being an NBA player takes work ethic, consistency. Right. Mm -hmm. Studying the plays mm -hmm. is not the same as just pulling up you know, to the park, Yeah. you know, people can start to study your moves, understand yeah. game after game, what your yeah. tendencies are. And now they can defend against it yeah. being a, a musician, right? Somebody who is good at making music and being a commercially successful, or let's not say commercially, because people have a, a perception of that. Just being a successful artist from a business standpoint, living your career, that is a different thing than just being a musician. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. No, for sure, for sure. The basketball analogy is interesting too, because if you if you listen to like JJ Reddick's podcast or like all these all these NBA players that talk about basketball in a completely different way, you know, right. and you're like, damn, you know, what's the pin down? What's the DHO? Like, you start to learn like there's a different there's a different level level of of yeah. of just studying and to to stay in the league, right? Because cats get drafted and then. You're like, where'd they go? You know, what I'm saying? like there's a certain yeah. way you have to carry yourself to be in the league if you're more of like a role player. Right. right? If you're a role player, you got to play your role, not just on the court, but you, you can't be a cancer in the locker room. You have to be prepared. You know, it's a different, it's a different ball game. If it's a, you know, Cat JJ was able to stay. I mean, he was a shooter, so you know, teams need shooters. 
but it's also that level of professionalism, just understanding kind of what keeps you in the league. I love those podcasts. I love, you know, that insight. So I I think it's a dope analogy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that makes me think even further, right? Because it's just about being a professional. Yeah. Right? So, like, as an artist, what does that even mean? What does it look like to even understand what's, what it requ- what's required to collaborate with somebody, mm-hmm. the different languages in the studio, the different languages when you're talking to your manager, or understanding all of those different roles, yeah. where they where they rely? Yeah, answering your emails, being quick with communication, texting mm-hmm. people back, calling people back, you know, keeping a calendar, uh, treating people with respect, being conscious of how you address people and the words you choose. Um, all that stuff matters if you want a longer career, right? Because yeah. if you're easier to work with, like every time somebody comes to me with an opportunity, I not only I'm always thinking about who's who do I know is going to execute this and not mess my name up. You know what I yes, mean? Exactly. I just I literally just passed on an opportunity to an artist, and I told the person, I was like, "Look, I got a perfect artist for you." I was like, "What what level of artist does the artist need to be?" So I got to get an understanding of like what stage in their career and then I told them I was like I promise you I won't send you anybody that will be difficult to mm-hmm. work with because it's so crucial and a lot of people are making those decisions but they're not going to tell you that right they're not going to tell you that I didn't bring this opportunity to you because the last time you came you know you smoked in the dressing room we told you not to do that right yeah. you're just not going to get the call right they're not going to give you that feedback they're just you're just not going to get the call again so you got to carry yourself with respect, got to treat people with respect, um, you know, be a professional and you'll get more opportunities. I'm glad you said that because, I mean, it, that's a fact. Most, like so many times the artists that might start it off as like just a client or something or they bought one of our courses. So we talk to them and we're helping them out. Then naturally we're always going to like end up looking at their music, understand the quality and then even the the way they ask questions. So you start to like pay attention to how they think Mm -hmm. and you build a relationship. And if there's an opportunity that comes, like I'm not managing um, anybody in particular. So Mm -hmm. I'm just going to think about, well, who do I know? Mm -hmm. Right. That can plug and play. And the first thing that you think about though, is still my reputation. Yeah, It has to be somebody where Dame is like, oh yeah, that was dope, man. Appreciate that, Sean. Versus mm-hmm. like, ah, oh, dang, Sean, your judgment <laughs> is poor, and I don't even know if I can trust you for any other business situation right. now. Like, it, it really right. is that simple. Yeah. Like being somebody that someone else can rely on and give opportunities to, yeah, because that actually, especially in a relationship business like that, mm-hmm. it makes you look good to have good judgment and have other good people around you. Basically, yeah. you yeah. know what I mean? For sure. Throwing the lob, don't you know? It's an assist for me. It's points for you, but it's an assist for me. People are still looking at assists too, so it helps me. So I'm definitely not, you know, throwing the lob to anybody that I know won't dunk it. You know, so <laughs> just give That's me, a if, fact. We, if we gonna keep with the basketball analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna um, play a Dame clip. Okay, and and, and, <laughs> and here's some more commentary oh. on something you said. All right, I'm gonna play this. It's messed up the blogs too, because the major labels realize like, oh shit, this is where like music is getting discovered. This is where music is starting to 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 win. So they started, you know, once they start getting involved with stuff, they typically fuck stuff up. They messed up South by. They mess up a lot of stuff. Like once they, you know, once indies do stuff it's successfully, and then the, the major labels look like, oh damn, we should do the same thing, and typically messes it up. So my actual, I'm gonna leave it there. Yeah. I want to hear more on that? Yeah, the major labels are always still in the independent ideas. Like all the stuff that's popular now is stuff the independent artists have been doing for the longest. You know, it's it's the direct to fan. You know, the the finding your super fans. Like we mm-hmm. we've been and and I we weren't pioneers of it. Like you know, independent cats have been independent for decades doing their thing, and they might have used different ways to get the fans. Like because ultimately, we built our label from social media. I felt like, you know, we really built it on Facebook, Facebook primarily, like during that time, Facebook was like everything for us because the algorithm wasn't as restrictive. There were hella people on it, you know, so I was organizing street teams on that joint. Like, so there was like, funk, there were groups like Funk Volume Los Angeles, Funk yeah. Volume Chicago, Funk Vo- and our fans were street team leaders. 
of each of those groups. So I just had to kind of, anytime we put out something, I send the email to the to the street team leaders and they put it in the groups and our stuff spread faster. So not to say the labels are doing that essentially, but they, they, they're they constantly looking at independent artists to see like what they can do and just put a bigger budget on it, right? They were, the, the blogs, like, you know, that was a great way for artists to get exposure if you had access to the blogs. We didn't get we didn't get coverage on blogs until we were popping. Like, you know, until we got our own numbers up, then the blogs started supporting what we were doing. So, um, but I feel like, you know, the major labels always try to co-op, you know, what <laughs> what independent artists are doing. That's where they get ideas from, is from from the independent space. So yeah. that's where the creativity is because we don't got the we didn't have the money. You gotta be creative when you don't have money. So the labels just come in, oh, we can do that and we can put twenty thousand on it. Like and then it just kinda messes up some of the experiences. Yeah, see that's where I thought you were going when I heard the club. I thought you were gonna cause I we've talked about this before where like major labels will up the cost to do marketing mm -hmm. a lot of the times, right? Mm -hmm. So like let's say for example, Sean runs whatever Instagram rap page. Sean might be charging seventy five dollars. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Whole indie community happy. I mean, we seventy five dollars post. Sean getting five to ten k views a post. Every time I use Sean, I get a hundred followers. Mm -hmm. And then the label will come along and be like, <laughs> "Oh, bro, like I see you got you know your page. What if I give you five hundred for it?" And Sean obviously is gonna take take exactly. the five hundred. But now Sean is thinking like, "Damn, if I get five hundred from Interscope, I can get five hundred <laughs> from Columbia." I'm charging everybody 500, right? And right. you know, some page curators and influencers are smart enough to know, you know what I'm saying, the difference between the two and it makes sense and some mm -hmm. aren't, right? Some will just see like, oh, this is my new floor. Yeah. And like that's where I thought you were going with For that sure. because I I think you know, I've heard similar things about like, you know, festival markets, um even though they're not supposed to be pay to play right or same thing about the blog era, right? Where it's like, hey, anytime there seems to be this sustainable pathway for artists to grow themselves, eventually the labels inject too much money into it and then yep. they outprice the rest of the market. And then what becomes interesting is because the labels have now priced the platform out the market, it no longer becomes as valuable to the labels as it was when that when Sean was charging $75. And now that Sean's yeah. charging 500 nobody yeah. wants to use him. He's posting less, he's growing yeah. a lot less, right? And so it kind of yeah. messes up the whole marketplace. So yeah, so then that whoever runs that blog is starting to get a bunch of money and their ego might start going out of control. I didn't too. think about that, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So now now it's not even about the blog, it's about that person. So now it's no longer even about the music like the, the music that you, you started the blog because you really were interested in the music and you love the culture and now it's just spiraled out of control. You know, yeah. so that's it's not, not even, my that, worth. That's not even the yeah. place. To, that's not even the place to find dope music anymore. That's just a pay to play situation, and the owner is an asshole. <laughs> like, so yeah, it's, yeah, I've seen it in real time many times. Either because we were paying for something, then the influencer or the page got management and up the price, and not, everybody saw that as an op or advising let's say for a label or a bigger situation so we inquire about the prices and then all of a sudden it's like dang i was kind of a part of <laughs> you know up in the price man i should have i should have yeah. did my campaigns in this order instead because this other artist might not have the budget but you can see in real time as they realize their potential and like and like jacory said most people don't understand the nuance um because i remember early on with tiktok like me and Jacory called it early, called it early on. We knew the, the labels were gonna run the numbers up and prices were gonna were gonna fly. But beyond the labels, you would see influencers who don't have the education mm -hmm. in general get brand deals. And it's like, yeah, bro, we not Snickers. Like this is an artist. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right. Snickers coming with yeah. a 5K bag just yeah. for a single post. And yeah. this is like indie artists, even label artists. Is like, yeah, I know this artist has a label. And y'all don't understand. These label budgets, they aren't as big as they seem on the outside. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So there's just all this education that slowly messes up the market. And yeah. our job as like indies, and if, and I didn't know that was our advantage coming in um, that we like started and we really like most people just didn't understand like how much like we're probably yeah. like 95 percent um, indie in terms of like just the numbers of and the people we serve. And that forces you, like you said, to be more creative, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. find the thing that gets the highest return on the value. Yeah. Right. And then when the label messes up, I'm like, all right, then we just have to find the next thing and find the next thing over and over again. That becomes right. the process because you don't have any other choice. Yeah. Not. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, and I'm not hating on blogs or because at the end, at the end of the day, like you guys got to get your get your For money sure. too, right? Yeah. But there needs to be some level of integrity to this. I, I remember I was a, I forget what year I was at South by, and then Rap Radar was up there laughing about like the pay to play situation like these cats are laughing up there i'm like yo like th- that's why i just kind of lost respect for for blogs and just how mm-hmm. they operate um and like who's getting the opportunities and you know just, again just how it shifted from you probably started the blog because you really wanted to be a part of the culture you want to push the culture forward and then it became a lick so you know it's just unfortunate i think it's a balance that every stakeholder in music Right, especially people who have media um, facing aspects. So that's an artist, right? That's media, PR facing. Mm-hmm. And then you have the platforms because there's a prime associated with that, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, my blog is hitting. I was only making this much. Oh, snap, I have this huge opportunity because I'm getting paid more. How do I maximize this, right? right? But then just like the artists, a blog might end, or a festival mm. might end up exploiting themselves too much and they damage the brand. So it's like, what is that balance? And everybody has to figure that out. It's like, how do I start to maximize value but maintain some level of in- integrity and in brand mm-hmm. so I can sustain? And although I might not make this money in the short term, right, over two years, I can still make that money over five years and then I'll still be around in 10 years and yeah. the like the hockey stick will go so crazy. I, I done made a hundred X. Right. Right. But I think it's it's so attractive and enticing when you just start seeing those bigger numbers and it starts to come easy. It's like, damn, yeah. these people are hitting me up. Yeah. Right. And they're yeah. just offering checks. You know what I'm saying? For and sure. the artist is like, oh, all of a sudden I'm making this much money per show and everything's going viral for the for the moment. So I don't have to build a r- real relationship with all these people because it's just happening for me at the mm-hmm. moment. Right. And I I think that's the dangerous period for like anybody when you first start to have certain levels of success, but especially people where it moves really quickly. And it's based off of some like media, like I said, front facing aspect. And that's, again, where an experienced manager com- comes in. Like if you have a great relationship with your manager that's kind of been down this road before, you know, hopefully you kind of can keep your your ego in check, your expectations in check and kind of play the long game as opposed to reacting to everything that's short term. Um, but again, that's another that's another area that a good manager could help out that you wouldn't even you wouldn't even think about, you know, in terms of like a responsibility day to day. Yeah. You you talked about um Rat Radar's, I guess, sentiments towards pay to play. Do do you feel like the the industry narrative around pay to play is changing at all? Do you think it is 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 different now compared to yesteryears? Yeah. Well, I don't really think. I mean, you know, because a lot of artists will say will blame their lack of success on the industry being pay to play, mm. right? But that's just an excuse because you know we see we see creators or artists move with very little to no money or start to build an audience mm-hmm. with very little to no money, right? Like I've seen rappers. Like just do freestyles in the back of their car, just like a series of of, of um, freestyles in the back of their car to build an audience, yeah. right? You know, Mr. Hotspot, he built an audience by smiling, right, and just oh, yeah. encouraging dancing. encouraging people to smile. Some yeah. people doing it dancing. So, I mean, eventually, you know, when you have a little money, you want to invest in your career and bootstrap bootstrap your business, um, you know. But I don't really, I don't really think it's like a pay to play. Situ- unless you're just if you, unless you're calling ads that you know what I mean like I don't I wouldn't pay like the worst fifty dollars that I ever spent and I still want it back <laughs> was at a conference before we started before we got momentum like I paid to get our song heard by this A and R person that I was like they played it and I was like they're like oh that's amazing and then I just walked out of the room and then I felt like <laughs> like give my fifty dollars back you know like, like what did I do this for so. I mean, it just it, people have different definitions of what pay to play is, but I don't, 
as an independent artist, like we, you, you there's so many creative ways to move and to mm -hmm. start some initial momentum. I mean, shit, you can sell merch these days with very little money with Printify and Printful. Like mm -hmm. you can, like you can just if you have like a certain skill, like let's just say it's freestyle, you could do like a weekly freestyle or whatever, and you start to build an audience that way. But every time you you do your freestyle, you end it with like some tagline or slogan or whatever and then that's what you want to put on your shirt like you can put up a website these days for less than a hundred dollars you know attach printful to it put that tagline on your shirt and start generating a little money you know so you can start with very little and just build but i don't think too many people are willing to put in that effort to build they just want like a huge lump sum dropped on their lap but like you guys know even if that did happen they wouldn't know what to do with it X. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, not even ask because I don't I don't necessarily believe in the notion of pay to play. I look at it as we are in investing in this platform that we look to maintain a relationship with. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, because we well, I, I know I've said on the pod before. Well, I, I personally feel like if someone took the time to build out their platform, I do feel like they deserve to be paid for it. But you know, I've noticed that there's an overwhelmingly large part of the industry that will feel like that's a bad thing, right? Like, and I don't know, I feel like it's kind of changing. Like a lot of the new massive platforms are starting to be very open about it. Like you can look on, let me think of a platform, like, you know, for shooters only, massive freestyle or you know, performance platform right now has in their bio, yo, submit for uh, submissions. If you go on the link, it tells you right there, this is the price, you know what I'm saying, yeah. to be on here. So I, you're starting to notice that it seems like a lot of the newer platforms don't shy away from it. So I thought it was interesting that you said someone like Rap Radar Ride, where they come from the, the more old school right. um, method of music where that was like, you know, like the ultimate sin, you know what I'm saying, was to learn that like, oh, Sean paid a hundred dollars to get on this radio show. That was like the right. ultimate sin back then. So I was just curious if you, had, if you had noticed like a shift in the attitude towards it. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, typically, you know, the pay to play from the era we came up with was like it referred to like radio or blog placements. Um, you know, if you're paying, if you really think this opportunity is legit, because there's a lot of whack, you know, fake opportunities out there. You know, that you submit, pay this and, you know, we'll look at your music or we might put you on. It really just depends on, you know, what the opportunity is. So I wouldn't necessarily say like, no, never pay to play. I would have to really understand what the opportunity is, what you're trying to use it for, what level you are in your career, and then we'll figure. Because even with like paying to get onto a tour, right? For most artists, I would say it's it's not worth paying to get on a tour. Right. However, if you're if you got a really dope live show, if they're allowing you merch space, if they're putting you on close to the main act. And like it's if the right artist, yeah, and it's the right demographic. Um, then you, I, I have seen in rare occasions like artists ending up making more than what they invested in their tour, and they picked up a shitload of fans, right? But for most artists, they're they shouldn't pay to get because because it's it, a lot of times it's a shitty opportunity because you don't really get much merch space. You're going on right when the doors open and nobody's in the building, so you have to mm -hmm. really again. Got to have an experienced manager to know to at, at, to to get to ask these questions, um, you know. So it's really just a case by case. Yeah. I, before I get to the, this one last topic, another Dame Dame 